You look at our country today, around the world, you know, hope is something that many people have lost. You look at what's going on in our nation alone, the pandemic, we have the riots, the election, and so many people today, I've heard the statement so often made, I've lost hope. How can you have hope in this? How can I have hope? There is no hope. And in fact, I was even looking last night and just looking at the world's response to a person who claims that they have no hope. And one of the responses I heard was the slogan today, the political slogan going on, is a new day of hope. If you look at the world's response to psychology, psychology says there's a six-step pattern in order to get your hope back. Find a clear path, look for role models who have found solutions, do what you know you can do, perform an act of kindness, turn to your faith, practice mindfulness while doing acts of kindness, and in your everyday life. Sounds good, does it not? Religion says, in fact, if you go to the religion of Buddha, he says, live, give, love, and learn. This is the world's response to a person who has lost hope. This morning, what I like to do is look to God's Word and see what God's Word says because it is God's Word that can truly give us hope. Why? Because it is God's Word, and it is alive, and it speaks to us right where we are at and why we need it at the time of life and in, in the events that we're going through. Life brings trials. I don't care who you are or where you're living, there are trials you go through in life, and if, you, if your faith is misplaced, you can lose hope. But there's something else, I believe, that can cause a person to lose hope. And this is what we will see today. When sin, when a person is living in sin, one of the results will be losing hope. So if I could title our message here this morning, it would be this, the picture of hope. And before we look to God's word, let's just open with a word of prayer and then we will dive into God's word here this morning. Father God, as we gather here this morning, we gather to worship you. We gather to lift up praises to you. Our hope is truly and only in Jesus Christ. He is the true rock, the foundation that we build up on. And Lord, I am thankful for Christ. I am thankful for the work that he has accomplished for me. I am thankful that he is the one who took my sin and died for me. My my greatest need is for my sin to be forgiven. And I praise you for taking that for me. I praise you for dying for my sin. God, as we gather here this morning, we gather to lift up you. Lord, our hope is placed in a living God. Our hope is placed in what you have accomplished for us. Lord, when I... When I take the reins of my life and I live and my hope is placed in myself or in man, God, you know things go downhill. Oh, Lord, I pray, help me. Help me to live for you. Help me to place my hope in you. Be with us now as we look at your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name and amen. As we come to Jeremiah chapter 17, I kind of want to give you a, a context of what is going on here in this passage. God has called Jeremiah to be a prophet. And when Jeremiah is being called to a prophet, he is a young man, most likely around the age 17, give or take some years. He is a young person as he goes into, in fact, he even says, God, I'm too young to be a prophet. And God says, don't let your age bother you. You will be my prophet. And most likely he's, he's being a prophet during the time of reign when Josiah is king. If you know anything about Josiah, he was the eight-year-old boy that becomes king. And as he goes throughout his time as being king, he goes and has the temple cleaned out. And as he cleans the temple out, he finds the law. And as you read the law, he begins this reformation in Judah. 
The northern kingdoms, they've just fallen to the Assyrian Empire. And this reformation begins in the southern tribes. And, and, and Josiah is trying to redeem his people, bringing them back to God. He goes and destroys all the, the, the false temple, the false idols, uh, places of worship. And he begins this reformation. Most likely that is the period of time that Jeremiah's ministry begins. And he continues on until Judah falls to the Babylonian Empire. That time is coming. Babylon probably has already begun to invade Jerusalem. They've already seen the invasions happening. And their hope is not in God. In fact, time and time again, God would say, turn from your sins, turn back to me, place your hope in me, Live by the laws, be obedient to me, and I will stop the invasion. Trust in me. And they continue to say, no. And this is the group of people that Jeremiah is prophesying to, that is preaching to. And in the context of the passage, verses 1 to 4, is going to describe who this group of people is that Jeremiah is speaking to. And so verse 1 says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. It describes the condition of their heart. They have sinned against God and turned against God so much that their hearts have hardened to urge God that it even requires now a pen of iron with a diamond tipped and even to uh, mark on their heart. And the picture right here is how sinful they have become. Their hearts have been hardened towards God. It's a warning to us. When a person continues to reject God, this is the condition that becomes the heart. A hardened heart. But that's not the only problem. Verse 2 says, While their children, they remember their altars and their ashram beside every green tree on the hills, on the mountains, in the open country. Not only have they misled themselves, but they've also brought their children along. And they misguided their children and they point them in the wrong directions. If you remember generations ago, Joshua said, As for my, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And now, as we come to this group of people, were they teaching their children to go and worship these false gods? In fact, if you read this, behind every tree... If you were to walk in Jerusalem at this time, God's city, you would see altars all over the hillside, all over the countryside, in people's homes. They were worshiping false gods. The children were following in suit. So what comes when a, when a nation, especially God's people, rejects the very God that delivered them out of the bondage of Egypt and they were to be God's people? and they reject them, God says, your wealth, all your treasures, these are the things that you value, I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you. God says, You're, you will lose your wealth. You will lose your heritage. This very land, the, the promised land that God was bringing them into, this was your land to live in, to dwell in, the land of milk and honey. You're losing it. I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. What is God speaking to his people right here? He's speaking the, to, to them the truth of His holiness. God must judge sin. As God has said time and time again, as you go throughout the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah warns God's people, if you don't stop saying judgment is coming. The same warning applies to us today. There is a judgment coming. For those who reject Christ... They're still living in their sin. Their sin is still upon them. 
And brothers and sisters, if you're listening right now, understand the magnitude of this message right here. If Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, your sin will condemn you for all eternity. God was judging His people right here because of their sin. He was telling them, this is coming. What does the Bible do for us today? Tells us God's judgment is coming. It's a shame how many people refuse to listen to this message in Jeremiah's time and even in today's time. Now, of course, if somebody hears this message as they're living in sin, hope is lost. In fact, what happens is their hope is misplaced. It's not that they lose hope. Their hope is misplaced. And maybe you're asking, were they really that bad? Was God's people really that bad? Well, if you turn back to 2 Kings, and I'll, I'll just kind of bullet point it to save time, but 2 Kings chapter 17, from verse 7 to verse 20, it describes the position of Israel, the northern tribes, how wicked they were, how they turned to. And I'll just bullet point some of the points. It says they walked in customs of other nations. They followed their gods their customs. They secretly did things that were not right against the Lord. They built altars and idols in every high places on every hill and every mountain. They did wicked things and provoked God. They despised God's law. They followed other nations and they abandoned God's law. They made metal images and worshipped them by throwing their own children into fire as a way of worship. And if you read verses 19 and 20, it says the southern tribes, the tribe of Judah, followed in suit. They did the exact same thing even after they saw God judge the northern tribes. In fact, as you go through the book of Jeremiah, God reveals to the people, this is how wicked you are. Foreign nations come to Jerusalem to know how to live a more sinful life. They were more sinful than the nations that surrounded them. This is God's people. This is the condition that they have gone to. In fact, as you look at the final several kings of Israel, they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Manasseh was one of the, one of the, the wicked kings that the southern tribes had. He offered his own son in a fire to worship a false god. They said there was so much bloodshed in Jerusalem, it would reach your shin. Innocent bloodshed. This is how far sin will take a person. Sin destroys us. Sin destroys a person. And ultimately what sin does is it causes us to lose hope. It causes us to misplace our hope. And what Judah was doing now was they were placing their hope in other things. They were placing their hope in false gods. In fact, Jeremiah began to make fun of them. And God even told them, fine, go to your false gods, pray to them, and see if they deliver, the, deliver you from your enemies. I'm not helping you. I'm not going to deliver you because of you rejecting me. Hope will be misplaced when you're living in sin. Now, there are times also, as we go through life, that we're, we're attacked from every corner. This happens in our life. This happens in our life. Where's hope? This is when we rely on the foundation of Christ. Now, as we look at this passage here, God's going to turn to his people, and he's going to read to them a parable. He says, verse 5, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and all the inhabited salt land. So you can imagine as Jeremiah is speaking to the people, as they're, as they're lined up in a group and they're listening to him speak this very message, Jeremiah is saying, don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in those foreign nations. See, they were trusting in their neighboring nations to deliver them. 
And even their neighboring nations would turn against them, the very ones they trusted in. They would trust in themselves to, to deliver themselves, and it wouldn't happen. So God says, cursed is the man who trusts in himself. And this isn't the first time God has said this. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Why? Because when we boast and put our trust in things other than God, they will always fail. Always. When we put our trust and faith in man, it will always fail. I will fail. It is why we put our trust in God. Our hope is in him. How was Judah trusting themselves? Well, they relied on themselves and other nations and their gods instead of God to deliver them from their enemies. So we pause here for a second and ask a question. Who do you trust during difficult times? When death of a loved one comes in your life, who do you trust? I think we'd all agree that when we lose a loved one, hope is something difficult to hold on to. And that challenge of that life, when we see a loved one that we've been with for so many years, I mean, if you were with us yesterday during Norm's funeral, it was a challenging time. A loved one that we, we lost. A dear brother in Christ, today glorifying God, worshiping God. How do we know that? Because we have hope in God's Word as to what God's Word says. It is true. Those who have faith in Jesus Christ, those who have, those who have placed their trust in Christ, the moment they die, they will stand before Him, not as a judge, but as a Savior. And He will walk them into heaven. That's the hope that we have when we lose a loved one, when we lose our job, and we say, there's no hope. How am I going to take care of my family? Who do we trust? Can God help us in that time? Absolutely. When persecution comes, when we receive bad news, who do you trust? God says, the man who trusts himself is cursed. The result of trusting in oneself. Now, first of all, causes us to turn our heart away from God. If we trust ourselves, we turn our hearts away from God. Why? Because we say, God, I got this. God, I can do this. And ultimately, the worst thing we can do is this. Trust ourselves to get into heaven. So many people today do that. We have a statement today that is made, are you a good person? And so many people today respond, yes, and that is what I'm relying on to get into heaven. When God looks at me, he's going to outweigh my good with my bad, and if my good outweighs the bad, God is going to let me come right on into heaven. That is the mentality of many, many people today. That is not what God's word says. I mean, picture this thought here for a moment. A criminal comes before a judge who has committed murder. And he looks at the judge and says, Judge, yes, I know I've committed murder. I'm sorry that I committed murder. But listen, I washed your car the other day. I helped the people at the orphanage out the other day. I helped the people. And he goes on and on. The good things that he has done. Does that matter? No. Not if justice is going to be served. No. He's going to be held accountable for his sin, the same as us. Listen, either you will pay for your sin in all eternity in hell, or Jesus Christ will pay for your sin on that cross. You trust in him, and he pays for your sin on that cross. So the first thing that happens when we trust ourselves, it causes us to turn, our, turn away from God. The second thing it does is in verse 6, he says, That person's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in a parched places of wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. If you've ever seen a picture of a desert, you don't see any green, do you? You see these dried up shrubs and they're all by themselves. 
And God says, the man who trusts themselves, this is what he's like. He is someone who is alone, and they have nothing when trials and disaster comes. There's nothing for them to hope in. But on the flip side, verse 7 and verse 8 speaks of the man who does trust in God. It says, blessed is the man who does trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water, sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when heat comes, for, it le- for its leaves remain green, and it's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah 9, 24 says, Him who boasts is this, but he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. See, what does God want us to boast in? Not ourselves, but in him. And the one who is just. And the one who understands love and righteousness. This is the one that we are to boast in. This is the one that we are to trust in. And God says, blessed is the man who trusts in him. And I can't help but think it mirrors Psalm 1. Psalm 1 reads, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The man who trusts in God. He says he is like a tree planted by water and sends out the roots by the stream. And he does not fear when heat comes. When the trials of life comes, he does not fear. Why? Because his trust is placed in God. When do people lose hope? When bad things happen. Do we not? That's when our hope is challenged, when bad things come in our life. And God says, the one who trusts in me doesn't fear when heat comes. He's not anxious in the year of drought. And continues to produce fruit. This is an understanding that does not make sense. If you have a garden and you take away the water from the garden, what happens to the garden? How much fruit does it produce? None. It doesn't. But yet, what does he say right here? The one who trusts in me, in spite of the drought, you will continue to produce fruit. Now, I cannot help but think, at this time, as Jeremiah is preaching this message, either they're in the audience listening, or this message gets down to them later on, Daniel and his friends are there. See, Babylon is invading here shortly. And we know that the last invasion, Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're taken off into captivity and they're taken into Babylon. And while they're in Babylon, who do they trust? I mean, you know the story. As Daniel and his friends, they got a dilemma. They have to eat the king's food. And they say, no, we're not going to. Give us this food to eat. And who... Because they eat the, the food that, that isn't offered to false, a false god, at the end of the period of time, they're healthier. They're healthier than anybody else. They're wiser than anybody else. And what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He appoints them as his chief advisors. We, we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When King Nebuchadnezzar builds the, the statue For them to worship. And anybody who does not worship this statue, what does he do? He builds this huge furnace to throw the people into. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of all the people in the land that's standing there, they're the three that say, we won't worship. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he gets angry over this. And he gives them a second chance. He says, when the music plays again, you bow to this God. If you don't, 
I will throw you into the furnace. And they refuse once again. And what does he do? He takes it and he throws him into the fire. But yet when he looks in the fire, what does he see? He doesn't see just three men walking around. But he sees the fourth and he says it looks like the Son of God. There's a fourth walking around in there. Why, why did God preserve them? Did God have to preserve them? No. Whether God just saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was not the point. The point was... They were faithful to him. They were faithful to God. And God says those who are faithful to him, they will continue to produce fruit even when the drought comes. Here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. Verse 9. The heart... As God has already instructed in the, in, in the context of this passage in verses 1 to 4, the heart is the problem. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? This is the problem of Judah. This is the problem of the northern tribes. It is their heart. It is the reason why their heart is hard. And in fact, if you go through Ezekiel, God begins to reveal what he is going to do with his people. How is he going to solve this problem of the heart? God says in Ezekiel, there's a time coming where I will remove the heart of stone and I will replace it with a living heart. How does God do that? Well, we know that today. He does that through Jesus Christ. When one comes to believe in Jesus Christ, there's a transformation that happens in us. There is a heart change. There is something that goes on in our life. The same thing happened in biblical times. Those who trusted in God, God was able to transform their heart. We see it in Daniel and his, and his friends. God transformed them. That's why they were faithful to him. Jeremiah had a transformed heart. But God was going to make it possible for that to happen in their future in Jesus Christ. He was going to change this. The Bible is very clear. Why does God put this verse in here? Why does he put this verse in here to, to speak to his people? The heart is deceitful above all things desperately sick. I think the King James says desperately wicked. Why does God put this verse in here? It is because it describes the human condition. This is what happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Adam experienced that fully when he had children. And his own son murdered his brother in cold blood. He experienced the, the depravity of man's heart. As we go through Genesis, as God looks out the people, and He says they are all wicked. Everything they think about is wicked. Every action they commit is wicked, is evil. And God brings the flood to judge the earth. Noah begins again, once again. And it doesn't take long for the sinful man to once again happen. We have the Tower of Babel where God divides the people out, forces them to leave, to replenish the earth. We come to this period of time and we see nothing has changed. We come to today, have we changed? You know, we live in a culture today where people do not want to hear that they are not good. Would you agree? That is an offensive statement, is it not? When you look at somebody and say, you're really not a good person, that is an offensive statement today. In fact, people will even say, well, I'm really not that bad. And so we look at the very next verse, because if somebody says, I'm really not that bad, the next verse is for you. But the very next verse says, it is I, the Lord, who search the heart, and it is I, the Lord, who test the mind. To give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. See, what God does, he puts the heart and the mind together. Both of these things he tests, both of these things he judges, and Jesus Christ, when he was on the Sermon on the Mount, he made this understandable. When Jesus was on the Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount, he was speaking to the Pharisees. He says, you've heard in the old, 
You shall not murder. Now, let's, let's be clear. I, I don't believe anybody here has ever physically murdered somebody. But what Jesus says, have you hated somebody? Have you hated somebody in your heart? I think we all agree. We all felt guilty of that. And Jesus says, I, God holds you accountable as being a murderer. Jesus says, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at lust, if you look lustfully at another person, you've committed adultery in the heart. And what was Jesus saying? God doesn't just test your outward actions, but the intentions of your heart. God judges as well. And I believe here's the reason why God puts this verse here. And it's not just here in Jeremiah. In Psalm 58, 3, it says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from the, from the birth, speaking lies. Romans 3, 10 says, None are righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 23 says, All sin and fall short of the glory of God. Ephesians 2, 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Why does God put this verse here? Because a person must come to realization why they need Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not a get-out-of-hell-free card. Jesus Christ is a relationship that He has come to transform us so that our heart is not desperately wicked. That's that stone heart that God is coming to change and to transform. You cannot get into heaven with a stone heart. It must be a heart that has been forgiven. A heart that has been removed and replaced with a flesh heart. Of course, we're speaking spiritually here. God is doing a heart transplant with people. A spiritual heart transplant. This is what is required for one to even be able to worship God. One to be able to serve God. This is what's needed. How does a person come to have a heart transplant? How does a person come to have that heart of, fl- of stone removed and a heart of flesh in its place? It comes by understanding first your need for a Savior. My heart is desperately wicked. That is the reason why I need Jesus Christ. If I were to trust myself, I would have no hope. Because every time I trust myself, I fail, and I fail, and, I, and I, I need Christ. I need Jesus. And you know, it was amazing how many times I talked to Norm before he passed away. And Pastor Roger will tell you the exact same thing. How many times Norm pointed us to Christ. How many times he says, He is my rock. He is my hope. He is the one who I am trusting in. We need Christ. When a person places their trust and faith in Him, when they realize their need for Jesus, you understand the depravity of your heart. I cannot save myself. No amount of time of coming to church, no amount of time of reading my Bible, no amount of time uh, of praying will ever save me, but Jesus Christ can and will when we turn to Him. See, I come to church, I pray, and I worship Him because He has saved me. It's a response to the changed heart that He has given within me. That's the fruit that comes about by being a Christian. A Christian will bear fruit. Just as he said in the, in the previous verse, in verse, verse 8, even during a drought, one bears fruit. A Christian bears fruit. If not, they're not a Christian. They've not had the transformed heart. God says, it is I who search the heart. He is the one who can truly search the heart. He says to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Jeremiah is telling the people, God will judge you. God will hold you accountable for your actions, for your deeds. Not just the things you say and do, but also the thoughts. 
the intentions of your heart. Verse 12, Jeremiah reads, A glorious throne set on high from the beginning. This is the place of our sanctuary. Where does one go? Where, where does Jeremiah say he goes? To the glorious throne to where God is in control. Our hope is in the one who sits on the throne. This place that Jeremiah is talking about, this is the place where believers come to worship God. This is His presence. This is where we go to worship Him. He says, The glorious throne set on high from the beginning. This is the place of our sanctuary. This is where we go. This is where our hope is in. The one who sits on the throne. The one who is in control of all things. You see, the reason why I have hope when bad things happen is because even in the midst of those bad things, God is in control. In the midst of what's going on in our country today, God is in control. In the midst of what's going on in the world, God is in control. No matter what happens tomorrow, next week, or next year, God is in control. Why? Because He is the one who sits on the throne. Babylon is coming and is going to invade Jerusalem and destroy it. Burn it to the ground. People are going to die. People are going to be carried off into captivity. Some people are going to run and flee. Jeremiah is actually taken captivity by his own people and carried off to Egypt. And in the midst of that, Jeremiah says, I trust in you. Because you're in control. Do you today? In the midst of whatever's going on in our lives, in your personal life, do you trust in God? He continues verse 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel. This is their only hope. Israel's only hope is in God. The sad thing is, they reject Him. They turn from Him. In fact, God even tells them, you're going to reject me. And as you go into captivity, you'll be there for 70 years, but there's a remnant that I will bring out of captivity. And from this remnant, you will rebuild my city. You will rebuild Jerusalem. And from that remnant, there will be a Savior who will come. And that Savior will be the one who will sit on my throne, who will deliver man from their sin, who will be mankind's Savior, who will be the promise fulfilled to Abraham, who will be the one who will bless all nations. This is Jesus Christ who's coming. And as God promised, He did. He accomplished exactly what He said He would do. Today, we gather here today to worship the God who is on His throne. We come here to worship Jesus Christ. O oh Israel, Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you, all who do not trust in you, they shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. What did Jesus Christ call himself when he stood with the woman at the well? What did he offer her? Living water. She will never thirst. And of course, she didn't understand completely what Jesus was talking about. He was speaking spiritually. This is what comes through salvation. This living water where you will never thirst. Where Jesus is enough. He's enough to get us through the trials of life. He's enough to get us through whatever we are going through. He's enough. Enough and more. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. Judgment. Those who have forsaken the Lord, they have forsaken the living water. Now if you know Jeremiah's story, if you go back several chapters, Jeremiah sided with his people. He sided against God. When God was, was proclaiming, this is what I'm going to do to your people, this is what I'm going to do to my people because of their sin, because they rejected me. Jeremiah sided with the people. He says, no, God, don't. And, and God even said, don't pray for them, Jeremiah. Don't intercede for them, Jeremiah. Don't take their side. And, and Jeremiah was taking the side of his people. And God, God judged him for that. And Jeremiah turned his ways and came back to God. And we see in verse 14, Jeremiah is praying for deliverance. 
And we'll end with this last verse here. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Jeremiah responds to God, heal me. What's his response? I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. Because of this, you are my praise. A number of times when we talked to, to Norm, every single time I spoke with him over the past few weeks, his praise was in God. His praise was for the one who saved him. Ultimately, God healed him when he brought him home, a glorified body. Can we have the same statement made? Can we make the same statement today? God, save me. I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me. You know, this is not a, a one-time thing. As we go throughout life, we need this response. This is the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. The gospel does not stop at the moment that you are saved. The gospel, we live it out every single day of our life. I need the gospel preached to me time and time and time again. Why? Because of my heart. I need the gospel. I need Christ. I need to reach out to God and say, God, save me. Yes, I am saved for all eternity. If I were to die today, I'm going to heaven. If I die tomorrow, I'm going to heaven. Why? Because Jesus Christ has saved me for all eternity. But I need him as long as I live in this fleshly body. There's a battle that goes on in every single one of us because of the sinful nature that lives within us. And we need Christ. We need His strength. Don't lie to yourself and say, I don't need it. Cursed is the man who trusts in himself. But blessed is the one who trusts in God. Jeremiah says, You are my praise. Can you say the same thing today? Can you honestly say, God, you are my praise. You are the one that I live for. You are the one that I receive the most joy in life out of. Can you say that? In the midst of what Jeremiah was going through, Jeremiah knew the judgment that was coming. Jeremiah was being persecuted on all sides. His very own friends that he grew up with from his own town wanted to kill him because of the message that he was preaching. He had it from all sides. And yet, what could Jeremiah say? God, I trust in you. You are my praise. Can you say the same thing? Let's close in prayer. Father God, we come here this morning. I praise you. I glorify you for what you have accomplished in Jesus Christ. I am thankful that I have a Savior who, who died in my place, who took the punishment that was rightly I deserve. God, I praise you. God, you know my heart. You know the thoughts that go through my mind at times. God, forgive me. Forgive me for, for when I do not stand up for you. Forgive me for when I think the, the sinful thoughts that I should not, should not go through my mind. God, forgive me for when I do not trust in you. God, I want to be a faithful servant to you. I want to be a faithful man here at Grace Gospel. I want to be a faithful teacher to the youth. I want to be faithful to you. God, I need you. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. God, this is not just a prayer for me, but God, we all need this. There's not a person here today in this sanctuary or listening online that does not need you. God, we need your forgiveness God, I pray if there is one here listening, whether it's online, here with us here this morning, that has never given their life to you, God, I pray they realize their need for, for Jesus Christ. 
the work that he accomplished, that their sins may be forgiven. Lord, I pray the Spirit speaks to them, takes that heart, changes it, transforms it, that they know they need Jesus Christ. God, as we continue to worship you, I pray, Lord, help us to be a light in this community. Help us to live for Jesus Christ. God, we love you. God, we praise you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. And amen.